for the dark hours when you dare not close your eyes. No sleep. It's the No Sleep Podcast. No sleep. Featuring stories from Reddit.com's No Sleep Forum. No sleep. Join us as the sleepless hours tick past. This episode of the No Sleep Podcast features just one tale, The Saga of Butcherface, written by A.J. Garlisi and read by David Cummings. In 1997, my friend Chris moved across the state. At that time, we were ten. We didn't really have a way to see each other besides getting a ride from our parents to one or the other's house, which would be a hassle for our parents, so we eventually lost contact. During this time, I had only gotten the chance to visit his house once. It was a very plain split-level house, probably built in the early 80s, with neighbors close by, so it wasn't even secluded. We lost contact with each other for ten years, that is until Chris contacted a mutual friend through MySpace. We made plans to hook up and hang out. Now that we had our own means of transportation, it was a lot easier. After maybe a month of this, Chris mentioned that his family would be remodeling the house, and I offered my help. He and his father gladly accepted the offer, since the previous owners apparently didn't keep up on it themselves. So, a couple weeks later, I drove down one weekend and we started tearing up carpeting, ripping off wallpaper, etc. The basement had been changed into a room for Chris some years before, and while half of the floor was concrete, The other half seemed to have been torn up and replaced with floorboards, and one of the boards had become warped and broken, leaving it protruding up from under the carpet, so they wanted to replace it. We tore up the carpet and started ripping out the floorboards when we found what looked like a hole dug about five feet into the ground under the floor. Chris jumped down there, thinking he could get better leverage to tear up the boards when he said something was down there. His father got a flashlight and we jumped down to check it out. It turned out to be a very worn box. It looked similar to a shoe box, but it was about three feet long and extremely damaged by the elements. It was so tattered that you wouldn't be able to pick it up in one piece. We believed that whatever was in it would be just as damaged, but when we ripped it open, we noticed that whatever was in it had the added protection of a black trash bag. Chris picked up the trash bag, and its contents made the sound of plastic hitting plastic. We were curious as to what was in there, so we brought it upstairs and cut the bag open with a pair of scissors and found 24 unmarked videotapes. Chris and I were curious as to what was on them, but his father claimed that they were most likely somebody's old bootleg collection, and if we're still curious, we should check them out later, after we were done for the day. Since the plan was for me to stay the night and help them out the next day, then leave Sunday night, we decided to watch them that night. Since Chris's father was tired and didn't really care what was on the tapes, he went to bed a little bit early that night. We pulled their old VCR from their attic, hooked it up to the TV in Chris's room, and took one of the tapes out of the bag and slipped it in. The tapes certainly weren't bootlegged movies like Chris's father believed. They were the home movies of an unknown man we eventually began to call Butcher Face. There was seemingly no flow from one scene to the next. It was like he would just film something random for what was usually just a couple of minutes, then put the camera away for God knows how long, until he found something else that interested him. Most of the footage was random footage, like him turning on the camera facing a chair. He would walk out from behind the camera to the chair, push it over onto the floor, walk back to the camera and turn it off. 
or him playing with a random spider, which he would talk to in a low, childlike voice, then end the tape with him squashing it, or him just filming down at his feet as he walks while deeply breathing. The one thing that always stuck out about all the footage is that on the few times that his face was shown, he was seen wearing what looked like a burlap sack tied tightly around his head with twine with two eye holes cut out. He was also a big guy, being easily over six feet tall with a decent build, with some muscles, but not being buff. A lot of the footage was creepier and sinister. Some of the footage was of him videotaping people leaving buildings and houses. He was obviously hiding somewhere across the street from these locations, and he was often breathing loudly. Even worse were the things he videotaped himself doing. One piece of footage showed him sitting at a table with a, a rat trapped in an empty pickle jar. He unscrewed the pickle jar, took the rat out, slowly put his hand on its head and started twisting until it stopped screaming. He twisted a little more until its head was completely ripped off the body. Then he turned the camera off. Another clip showed him in a barn. There was no barn on Chris's property, so we don't know where this was filmed. He turned the camera on, showing a pig tied to a post. He walked over to the pig with an axe in his hand and hacked its head off. What was really creepy was that most of the footage was shot in what was now my friend's house. It was always dark in the footage, like this man didn't like to have the lights on. But we did recognize various locations of the house. One piece of footage was obviously shot in the living room, which showed Butcher Face using a large hunting knife to cut the power cord of something we couldn't see, wrapping this cord tightly around his arm, grunting and moaning as he did it, and using the knife to cut deep cuts into his hand and arm. One disturbing clip showed him standing in front of a table in the kitchen. On the table was a clothes iron. He then unzipped his pants, took out his penis, put it on the table, and pressed the hot iron against it. He screamed, but didn't take it off for about 30 seconds. He finally took it off, limped over to the camera, and turned it off. What freaked us out the most was a clip of Butcher Face in what used to be Chris's upstairs bedroom before he moved to the basement. He turned the camera on and showed the whole room covered in what appeared to be hundreds of lit candles. They were on every table, chair, and shelf. The walls were covered in paintings of grotesque and ghostly faces. He then walked to a corner of the room and started furiously carving something into the floor with the hunting knife. He would stab it into the floor and drag it around, pull it out, and stab it again. Since that room was vacant at the moment and used for storage and was going to be renovated anyway, Chris's father let us tear up the carpet in that area of the room. What we found was a section of the floor that had been heavily sanded down with no real evidence of what had been carved there. Another tape showed footage of Butcher Face in that same room with even more candles. He was on his knees, facing away from the camera, with his arms in the air, screaming to be brought to the pits of pain and torture. One interesting thing about that clip is that he only had three fingers on his left hand, missing his pinky and ring finger. He had all five fingers in the previous clips, and we think he cut them off. That was the end of that one, and the camera appeared to run out of tape. The last piece of footage on the last tape showed Butcher Face furiously digging the hole that we found in the basement. He was digging fast and breathing heavily. He was constantly grunting. His shirt was off, but he still had the mask on. After a couple minutes of him just digging, he started talking, saying something like, This is it. This is it. They won't know. They'll never find me. This is where I'll hide. 
We were getting tired of having to lug the VCR up and down those steep attic steps because Chris's father, for some reason, kept asking us to put it back up there when we weren't using it. About two weeks after we found the Butcher Face tapes, Chris's younger brother Evan, who was going to college for media production, came into the middle of a conversation about this and mentioned that he could convert the tapes to DVD using equipment at his college. After some haggling and way too much negotiating, Chris and I, having recently turned 21, would get the liquor for a party that friends of Evan's were having if he'd do the conversion the next day. When that day came, both Chris and I were waiting anxiously in the kitchen for Evan to get home. When he finally walked in the door, an hour later than he said he'd be back, he was looking extremely pale. We asked him if he was done converting and he jumped in our faces saying that we never told him what was on the tapes. Apparently, he didn't actually hear what we were talking about and only heard that we wanted some tapes converted and he thought they were more like old family recordings of Christmas or birthday videos. We calmed him down and asked him if he converted the tapes. He said no and quickly left the room. We were disappointed and started talking about what to do next when Evan came back into the room with his father behind him. After talking about what was on the tapes, Evan retrieved them from his car and the four of us watched every one of the 24 tapes together. After the last tape was finished, the one with, this is it, this is it, they won't know, they'll never find me, this is where I'll hide, Chris's father's face was just as pale as Evan's was earlier. He leaned back in his chair and said, That was creepy. An hour of talking that night ended with us wanting to know who was on the tapes. I left for home soon after with the understanding that I would be kept in the loop on what we would do next, which was to figure out the previous owners of the house. A couple days later, I got a phone call from Chris saying that it took them a little while, they found nothing on the county website, but they found some history on the house at the town library on something called a reverse directory about a previous owner who had it in the mid-80s. After a few unanswered phone calls, we decided to visit these people in person. So that Friday, me, Chris, and his father drove to their house and knocked on the door, only to be greeted by two 80-something-year-old women. Chris's father told them that his family was living in their old house and asked if we could ask them some questions about it. They refused to let us in, but they did tell us about their old house. It turned out they were sisters. Their first names were Shirley and Louise. And Louise turned out to be the former owner of the house, but never lived in it. Apparently, she and her husband bought the house and were planning to add some new wiring and plumbing before moving in but her husband had a severe stroke not too long after buying it, and eventually died. With the combination of hospital and funerary bills, Louise couldn't afford to fix it up and live there, so she moved in with her sister instead. But she did mention that during that time, the house was known to be home to a fair number of homeless people who would be regularly chased off the property. We also asked if either of them had a son, and they both said no. We left there with not too many answers. A couple of weeks later, Chris and I went to the movies with his girlfriend. I think he was trying to get his mind off the tapes because I could tell that he was still creeped out. We were talking about how much the movie sucked when Chris slammed on the brakes. We practically skidded about 30 feet and I was choked by my seatbelt and his girlfriend, who wasn't wearing a seatbelt, was almost thrown into the front seat. We started screaming at him, asking him what the hell he was doing when we looked at what he was staring at and saw a house. It looked familiar to me, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I looked back to Chris and he said, That house is on the tapes. Then I remembered, one of the houses that Butcher Face had watched people come and go from was right there, not 20 feet from us. We knocked on the door, but no one answered, so we decided to come back later. When we got back to Chris's house, I noticed the VCR hooked back up to Chris's TV in his room, 